So I always feel like the bearer of bad news when I stand before a crowd discussing Disney. Um, because this is a hard topic for us. We absolutely love Disney because it's so much a part of our childhood, our fond memories, our magical dreams that we've created for ourselves, and even those fabulous theme parks. So how dare I? Um, but I wouldn't be a good media study scholar if I didn't interrogate some of those issues that happen in American, in the aspects of American life that give us the opportunity to understand more about ourselves. Um, and so I stand here today prepared to raise a few questions about the beloved Disney Princess brand and how Princess Tiana of the film The Princess and the Frog fits into this scheme. So back in 2001, the Disney executive, Andy Mooney, created what we understand as the Disney Princess brand. This is the original lineup. Uh, he had this brilliant idea to package the entire Disney brand under the umbrella of 11 different princesses instead of continuing to try and sell them individually, which was not as profitable for Disney. So packaging them as one where you walk into a store and grab all 11 and walk out seemed to be more appealing and attractive, which it was. So to date we have 11 princesses, we have Snow White, who is the very first princess in 1937. And then we end with Merida, who is from the film Brave in 2012. Just last year, this package brand earned Disney $5.5 billion. So I want to discuss specifically Princess Tiana. But before I do that, I want to contextualize the conversation about princesses so that we understand how they seem to fit into this nicely framed um, um, understanding of even feminism, specifically in terms of the waves of feminism. First, I start with first the first wave princesses, which align quite well with first wave feminism, which seem to center on women's suffrage and voting rights. And of course, during this time period, we know that that the Voting Rights Act um, allowing women to vote was also passed, the 19th Amendment. And so these three princesses that I have before you, um, Snow White, of course, the first princess, Cinderella, and Sleeper and Beauty are fitting under this, this particular um, framework because of increased political rights, but they seem to lack a lot of social equality and their autonomy seemed to be limited during this time. In fact, what we do know about these princesses is that beauty was their primary asset, and the goal was to be married. So the damsel in distress trope that we all come to understand fits very nicely under the three of these because at the end of the film, of course, a prince comes to save them and they live happily ever after. What's interesting to mention about feminism is second wave feminism, we note that Disney did not produce one single princess during this time. Um, the publication of The Feminine Mystique came out in 1963. Second wave feminism goes into well into the 80s. Um, we see no Disney princesses during this time, but there's a lot of action happening in feminism, clearly. So we know in terms of women fighting for the right to be in the workplace. We know also in terms of legislation around rape and, um, and abortion, that these became very important issues for women and their ability to kind of break free from the traditional roles of women during this time. It's not until third wave feminism that we're introduced to a slew. All of a sudden we move from three princesses in one decade, in one time frame, to now we're at five at once. And the first of those is Be I'm sorry, Ariel from The Little, Lur Little Mermaid. She comes to us in 1989. And Ariel, um, among all of the other princesses, still seems to embody some of those traditional roles that we understand about women, that clearly beauty is very significant. But here's where the shift takes place, that we start to see that beauty, femininity, and certainly um, orientation becomes something that women are choosing to redefine for themselves. 
We also know that in terms of feminism, that we now are shifting away from the traditional way of how we've talked about feminism, that we are not only talking about straight, white, middle-class women, we're now broadening our understanding of feminism and including the voices of women of color. Hence why you see a number of princesses of color during this time. So we have Pocahontas, we also have Jasmine from Aladdin, and then we have Mulan that comes out in 1998. So what we also understand though is it still seems like these women need the heavy, uh, happily ever after uh, with the ultimate goal of marrying that individual that will make their lives fulfilled. Then fourth wave princesses, which seems to be where we soundly or squarely situate ourselves at this point. And oftentimes we have Rapunzel from Tangled, Merida from Brave, and even though they are not a part of the official Disney brand, Frozen gets bundled into this conversation. And in fact, just as a quick side note, Frozen does not become a part of the official, official Disney brand because it makes too much money without being a part of the other 11. <laughs> Frozen, as of last year, by itself, was a $1.2 billion industry. So they don't need to be a part of the other 11. But I mention, I mention all um, these three particular films because it's important to see that in fourth wave feminism, as is in fourth wave princesses, that there is this pushing out of women seeking and understanding their greater independence, that they are moving away from what we see as being very traditional roles and seeing themselves as these very independent bodies that can do what they desire to do with their lives. These films are in the midst of women claiming social equality between the sexes, while also addressing issues head on that are impacting our society. Uh, sexual harassment, um, workplace discrimination, and even body shaming. But I ask the question, hmm, where is Tiana? The Princess and the Frog came out in 2009, so it seems like it would fit squarely in fourth wave feminism. But interestingly enough, except for myself and two other scholars that I know of, very few people even address Tiana in their research. So she becomes this bleep on the screen, not often being talked about in the concept of these waves of princesses, nor in the idea of how important and significant she is to the Disney princess brand. Some of this is, uh, of course, about how, she, how well her film performed. So The Princess and the Frog, again, came out in 2009. Uh, the film had a budget of $105 million. The film earned $267 million. Just to put that in context for you, 11 years prior, Mulan was the, uh, the last princess, and in 1998, she had a much smaller budget for the film, but she earned $304 million. So for Disney, this was a flop. This was not a successful film. It also needs to be mentioned that when we do a ranking of the princesses and how they perform in terms of product merchandising, Tiana is last of the 11 princesses. Um, and then, of course, anecdotally I'm speaking when I talk to friends who take their daughters to the theme parks, excited about seeing Princess Tiana, the message often is she was nowhere to be found. So let's make the connection that, of why Princess Tiana does need to become important. And I threw this in here because I thought it would be cute for you to see um, the expression of why worry about glass ceilings when you can wear a glass slipper. And the reason this becomes important is because Tiana is representing exactly that major shift where the glass slipper is not so significant, that there are other regions and areas in which she plans to break through on behalf of Disney. 
but she doesn't get talked about in that way. We almost seem to skip over her, again, because of her lack of commercial success, and move immediately into those films that did very well. But I argue that Tiana is that character that shifts our perceptions of princesses from the glass slipper easily into the 21st century. Um, the glass cliff. So what's interesting about this concept is it's never talked about in terms of animation. And I decided it fits. Let's work it out. And the reason is because oftentimes when we talk about the glass cliff, we're talking about organizations or corporations um, that are looking out to bring in leadership roles among women and people of color. And as the quotes read to you, that they oftentimes um, secure those high level leadership opportunities when an organization is in decline, is currently in crisis, or, it is, or is at a high risk of failing. And oftentimes what we know after the fact is that upon their relative stability, when they reach the point of seemingly being successful or back on solid ground again, that they return to the status quo, often filling those leadership positions with individuals who are so-called expected to serve in that role. So behold, here are a few examples of glass cliffers. So I share with you, um, Rosalind, excuse me, Rosalind Brewster of the Sam's Club, formerly of Sam's Club, Marissa Meyer, formerly of Yahoo, Indra Noyi, formerly of PepsiCo, and of course our president, former president Barack Obama. All are or were CEOs or presidents of corporations and one of a country. Um, but they also share in common their assume, uh, that they actually assume their roles in times of crises, when the corporations were um, failing in terms of their market share, when they were not as successful with the, some of the product merchandising that they had produced, when the country was having great despair financially, and even in terms of some of the political decisions abroad. And most of them, seemingly were replaced by those expected ones, oftentimes white and male. But Princess Tiana, how can she be a glass cliffer? Um, Disney was not a corporation in crisis, but its Disney princess brand was. Mothers everywhere were shunning the idea of a princess because of the image being so limiting and not empowering their children. Hence why Mooney was savvy enough to create this brand. The princesses had to be packaged that way in order to make money since the individual sales of each princess was so small. But that's what makes Princess Tiana so significant. She's the first princess of the 21st century entering again in 2009, and embodies what many moms, including myself, desire for their children, um, which also includes aspects of fourth wave feminism. So things like ambition, entrepreneurship, loving ties with family members, and love if it happens, not when it happens. And she does this in her film. So seemingly, Tiana has it all, because if, for those of you who have seen the film, you know that not only does she become the business owner that she desired from the very beginning of the film, but she also gets her man. <laughs> she also represents for us a greater sense of diversity, again, continuing to push and expand the notions of feminism by being the very first black princess in Disney's 90 plus year history. Rarely do we see, um, or rarely is it acknowledged, that this role in the shift from that very traditional limiting princess trope of the 20th century be given credit to Princess Tiana for being the one that pushes the bounds of that princess trope and says, no more. 
I can do this differently. And in fact, even in the film, Disney gives us the opportunity to see the actual shift between the princesses because Tiana's best friend, Charlotte, represents everything that is a part of the 20th century trope of um, the princess. And we see how buffoonish she appears to us in the film. And it gets juxtaposed against Tiana so that we know, ah, this is who we want to follow. This is who we want to be more like. But she's not given the credit in which to do so. But what's next? So what's interesting I want to share very quickly before I even move to this point is immediately after The Princess and the Frog, over the next couple of years, two other films come out that are quite successful. D Disney created um, Tangled, which made $591 million in 2010. And then they made Brave in 2012, which earned $540 million. And then, of course, Frozen hit the scene. And as I mentioned, Frozen is an industry of its own and doesn't need to be packaged with um, the other princesses. But I want to draw your attention to the fact that immediately after Princess Tiana, we go to a period of three sets of movies that are white females. And what's even more interesting, and hopefully you'll pick it up as a um, joke, is that when we think about um, Frozen and Elsa and how white and translucent she is, It is a clear indication by Disney of where they want to be and how successful they want to be with this newfound Disney trope that gives greater independence to all of our young children who are watching this, but yet and still, it has to be packaged in a particular form. But all is not lost, because that's why I raised the question, what's next? Because I also argue that even though Princess Tiana becomes that glass cliffer, she's the one that makes the steps off the cliff and shows us that there's something different about how the princesses can be, she also created space for us to start seeing something else in Disney. So art actually imitates life, but there's even an opportunity for life to imitate art because Disney at this moment seems to be doing a better job than we do in life. And so we have examples of Moana. We also have the television show um, uh, Princess Elena of Avalor. And then, of course, most recently, the um, sister who plays the role of a princess, Shuri, in The Black Panther. Um, so I ask the question or end by simply saying, so what? Uh, while Tiana is clearly a glass cliffer in animation, she also means so much more to others. And the work that I do around Disney, although it seems unnerving to some to disturb something so very important to us, it also is to center Tiana's role in Disney's history and to ensure her rightful place in animation's history. She was the catalyst to shift our perception of what a princess could look like in skin tone and in her actions and attributes. She is also the one that helped to support the success of this new brand, this new idea of what our princesses can look like. And finally, she is also important because of how she impacts those roles, such as child in our childhood. As Disney's first black princess on the big screen, little girls who looked like her everywhere immediately gravitated to her, including my own daughter, who was three at the time. This image that I show you now um, features a little girl who approached Anika Noni Rose, who is the actress that actually voiced Tiana in the film. And this is at a White House screening for the television series Roots. But this little girl asked her parents to be there and present at that screening, all because she wanted to have the opportunity to meet Princess Tiana. She didn't care about this screening. She just wanted the chance to talk to Princess Tiana. And that shows all of us that representation matters. Thank you. <laughs>